Our first guest on the show today is a candidate for the U.S. House, Brian Rooney. Hey, Brian. Hi. Great to be back. Welcome back. I think uh, the countdown, uh, it's hours now until the election day. 96 hours, Tuesday, August 3rd. A lot of people are already voting absentee, but you know, the main thrust is on Tuesday. I'll be voting at 10 o'clock in the morning and then going out to the different precincts to try to get my name ID out there and encourage people to continue to vote. How do you think the, the campaign has gone? It's gone very well. Since last time I was here, we uh, gotten a lot of very good endorsements. We have a lot of strong support throughout the district, but we put our anchor here in Jackson to begin with. Our campaign office is across the street, uh, 103 South Jackson Street. And, uh, you know, we've worked hard in Jackson because I really believe that if I win Jackson, I'll win the race. If I lose Jackson, I'll lose the race. So we've worked hard here. We've hit 35,000 doors <clears throat> in the whole district, but the majority of them here in Jackson. And um, I'm very pleased with how our campaign has gone. Yeah, Jackson is almost the swing state of the district. It is, most definitely. I feel very good about the, the Calhoun County, Eaton County, Washtenaw County. I've made a good dent down in the southern three counties of Lenaway, Hillsdale, and Branch, but right here is where we're going to either live or die. And um, I put my most effort here in Jackson, and um, I'm going to do that in the general election as well because the same thing holds true there. So we're the swing district here, swing county in Jackson, and um, I feel like we're going to pull it out right here in Jackson. Had some newspaper endorsements this week? We did. We had the Detroit Free Press, which is traditionally more of the moderate liberal uh, newspaper in Detroit. And then we had the Detroit News, which is the more conservative one. So I've said from the beginning of this election that I've wanted to unite the Republican Party, bring it together, and uh, move forward so that we can beat the current congressman like we used to with uh, overwhelming majorities. And I've been able to do that. And uh, I believe that if we get our vote out, we have the more support than uh, anybody else in the primary. And if we can get them out, we're going to win. Um, uh, the prosecutor here, Hank Zavislak, the sheriff, Sheriff Hines, um, have endorsed me uh, early on. And they really turned the tide for me here in Jackson. Um, so I'm very pleased with how our campaign has gone to this point. And we're going to start a road tour starting tomorrow morning. We're going to hit every county in the next two days. I'm going to hit all the counties, different spots, different events throughout. And then on uh, Monday, I'm going to have some of my family members come up. I have a, a large Irish Catholic family, live all over the place, but my dad, two of my brother's brother-in-law are going to come up, and we're going to have a meet and greet at my office at 103 South Jackson at 6 o'clock. My one brother is a current congressman down in Florida, Tom Rooney, and um, so we have a chance to meet him, see what's going on in D.C. and those sorts of things. And then um, Tuesday we're going to have our victory party across the street at Belle Note at 8 p.m. Uh, isn't there a third brother that uh, was considering a, a campaign for Congress, too? My brother Pat's going to be here as well. He's running for State House in okay. Florida. Um, he, uh, he's more uh, interested uh, in state local politics down in Florida than uh, some of the federal issues. And my resume speaks more to federal issues because of my Marine Corps service and uh, being a veteran and living on two border towns while I was in the Marine Corps. Um, and, and having a special needs child at Mott Children's Hospital saving his life and, and those sorts of things. So uh, that's why I ran for Congress rather than State House or State Senate because I believe I can serve the people of this district best in Congress. Your, uh, your son was born with a, a heart defect uh, and also uh, the, besides the heart there were brain issues as well, right? It was during the time uh, that uh, you were at Mott's that you um, decided that you were going to run, and it was uh, Obamacare that sounds like the issue, the primary issue that, that got you in the race. It was a tipping point for me. You know, uh, so many things in my life have, that I've been involved with, or, you know, I've had this old Marine attitude, if you want something done right, you do it yourself. And when I looked out at the playing field about who was going to try to you know, get this thing back so that we can move it forward. I wasn't excited about anybody, and my wife really encouraged me to run. And um, you know, I thought to myself, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? And you know, I know I have three young children, but I'm really running for them because I'm afraid what the future might hold here in Michigan for the health care that we have. We have the best specialized health care in the world. People come from all over the world to save their children's lives here in Michigan, and I don't want that to atrophy or go away. But I also want my children to grow up here in Michigan as proud Michiganders with Michigan values. And after they graduate, 
U of M, MSU, Hillsdale, Adrian, Albion, any of these colleges, JCC, I want them to stay here. And right now too many of our kids and grandkids are leaving the state. And my main goal is to make Michigan, help make Michigan business friendly again. What is it about o Obamacare, the, the federal health legislation that uh, you find most disturbing? I'm all for reform of health care. Um, I'm just conservative by nature, so I'd rather take it bullet by bullet. My son has a pre-existing condition. Let's come to common agreement amongst Democrats and Republicans how to fix that and move on to the next thing. Comprehensive reform in anything I don't support because whenever the federal government or any government says, we can do it all and we can do it well, I don't believe them. I'd rather say, let's attack this one issue and then move to the next issue. That's the way I would have approached it. That's the way I, w I will do it when I get down to D.C. if I'm fortunate enough to be elected. But ultimately what I fear, what my wife fear, and what a lot of uh, families like mine fear is that you're going to shift insurance, you're going to shift costs from insurers to providers. And providers will do what any business do. They'll try to cut their costs by limiting access to things that cost the most. So seniors have a right to be concerned because you know, their care costs the most, but so do parents like myself, because my care with my child costs a lot. Where you have 15 beds at my children's hospital that deal with hearts that big, uh, they sometimes cost a million dollars to fix or transplant. And I'm fearful that in the future, a bureaucrat in the hospital will say, not being a bad person, but having to meet the bottom line, say, we can use this money for more people elsewhere, so let's get rid of that department. And so where I was given hope here in Michigan by saying you can either terminate your child's life, have hospice care, or save his life at the University of Michigan, I'm fearful in the future the options will be you can have hospice care or termination because we don't do the other thing any, anymore. And since we don't do it in Michigan, that means we don't do it anywhere. And we can do better as Americans, as Michiganders, we should expect more. We are the best nation in the world. I believe, as Ronald Reagan did, I grew up with Ronald Reagan, that we are the shining city on the hill, the exceptional country, and we should expect the best. Well, it's pretty obvious what your stand is on, on abortion, being a Catholic, a conservative, but has the right to life uh, made endorsements in this race? They've uh, endorsed all of us, okay. for lack of a better term. They've said we all meet the endorsement criteria of Michigan right to life. Um, and I worked at the Thomas More Law Center, which is in Washtenaw County. It's a co constitutional conservative law firm that deals with life issues, free speech issues, national security issues. So. You know, I've been involved in the right to life issue for a long time, and I live it every day with my son. So it's an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Government spending, that's uh, an area where you've talked uh, on a number of occasions and uh, a couple of issues. One, uh, unemployment benefits, um, earmarks, uh, two, let's take those uh, first. With Hillsdale County as an example, I believe their unemployment rate is 25% or something Their like that. Their real unemployment is probably around that. Yeah. You know, I wish that someone running for governor would sp spend more time in Hillsdale and say, if we can turn Hillsdale around, we can turn the rest of the state around. I'm not for uh, extending unemployment benefits unless they're paid for. And that's the only reason I was against the last bill, because it wasn't paid for. You know, we, start ha we have to start acting responsibly in government because Michigan families, American families all over the country are acting responsibly around their dinner table with their budgets. We need to start doing that as well. And I've, I've often said in this, de this debate for primary uh, electors that I'm not a purist when it comes to earmarks because uh, we don't do everything right in Congress. We don't abide by the Constitution 100%. And one example of that is when we go to war, we don't declare it any longer. And because we don't declare war, the Pentagon's never put it on a a war footing, and so it's business as usual. And so the only way we got MRAPs, which are vehicles that save lives in Afghanistan and Iraq, or the hardened Humvees, or even the body armor we had is through earmarks, because it wasn't getting done fast enough, and literally troops were dying in the field because we were doing business as usual. So if you're going to get rid of earmarks, you're going to have to explain to the families of service members that are killed in Iraq that, you know, we just didn't want to spend the money because uh, we're against all earmarks altogether. I don't have a problem with fully vetted earmarks that are transparent that people know are going on. I'm against the bridges of nowhere, the pork barrel spending that is hidden in appropriation bills. But we also have to be realistic about, you know, monies that is our money anyway. Michigan's a pay east state. We need to be made hold on on uh, taxes that we pay as it is. And it's well, you know, realistically too, being one of 435 uh, congressmen, uh, you can't single-handedly change the earmark uh, system overnight? No, you can't. You can work towards 
getting everybody to say, okay, let's let's stop doing business like this and let's move forward without the uh, the way we've done it in the past with this appropriations, hiding earmarks into those sorts of things, having the bridges to nowhere, the lobster institutes and those. I mean, here in Michigan, we have sidewalks to nowhere. If you go on I-94 in Ypsilanti or I-275, there are sidewalks on the side of interstate highways. Why? I have no idea. But I know that when I pay federal gas tax, $1 goes down to D.C., 93 cents comes back to us. When they have the pool in D.C. with the Department of Transportation, 40% goes to our highways. 60% this year goes to those sidewalks to nowhere or greenways, which are nice to have, but our roads are dangerous. Well, they tear down perfectly fine rest areas, uh, demolish them completely so they can rebuild them from scratch. Yeah. They've done that on 94 in the last couple of years. Right. That's why I'm all for devolving certain departments and agencies in the federal government saying, hey, let's keep our money in Michigan. We can do it better here anyway. Something happened this week that uh, alarmed, I think, just about everybody, the oil spill uh, in Calhoun County in Marshall. Uh, a lot of people think there was a late or a limited government response both uh, on a state and federal level. Did something uh, go wrong that uh, should have uh, been remedied sooner? Well, I can tell you, when I drove to Battle Creek that morning, I had an interview, we had a debate that morning, and I could smell it right away. You know, I knew something was up, and when I passed the Kal Kalamazoo River, I saw it was black as coal, and it was overflowing the banks, and I knew something disastrous had occurred. And then I heard our governor say the response has been anemic. You know, maybe it's just the Marine Corps officer in me, but when I hear the leader of the state, I don't care if Republican or Democrat, say, well, our response has been anemic. That's not the answer I want to hear as a citizen of Michigan. I want to hear, what's your plan of action? How are you going to remedy this problem? How are you going to make sure it doesn't happen in the future? And tell the citizens what exactly we're doing right now. One of the basic leadership principles that you're taught in the Marine Corps is keep your troops informed. And in this case, we're the troops. I still don't know what we're doing to fix that situation down there. We have a lot of politicians doing photo ops, you know, getting their pictures in the paper by the Black River there, but I'd rather hear them say what they're gonna do, and I'd rather see the DNR, uh, EPA, and all those other agencies that are supposed to be uh, responding to this right away, responding and knowing what they're doing. Maybe they are, we just don't know. Well, I think that's part of it. We, uh, My observation has been the media has not provided much information. It doesn't appear that the, there's been a lot of coverage, but also and looking further that they've tried to get information and the company responsible and, and government has, they've canceled press conferences, they haven't been available, so uh, the information just hasn't been there. Yeah, we, we really have a lack of leadership going on on all levels there, whether it's state, local, or even federal. And uh, especially when coming off the heels of the Gulf disaster, you would think that we'd have mass casualty kind of uh, plans in place for these sorts of things, and obviously we don't. And we need to do the job better because when you have a disaster of this magnitude in a highly populated area where the, the specter of this benzene and oil getting into Lake Michigan is, is there, uh, we need to expect more of our politicians and the people that are uh, tasked in these agencies, whether they're state or local, to do their job and do it well.